Hello everyone, and welcome back to the Microsoft Flight Simulator Evolution of Aircraft Design. Fourth episode, and we're jumping from the 1920s to the 1930s. This episode will feature two airplanes from 1930 to 1939. Starting with this one, which is one of my all-time favorite flight sim planes, the Boeing 247. Now, of course, as we saw in the earlier days, aircraft started getting more standardized materials. We started seeing a lot more metal. We started seeing some other controls. We started seeing multiple engines. We started seeing better instrumentation. We even started seeing electrical systems. But this aircraft represents a big jump because there's a lot of things we see in this airplane that you won't see in others, including trim tabs, uh, something we had very, very little of until this particular point. That's something I'm kind of glad that we have. You'll notice we have a trim tab on the elevator as well as a trim tab over here on the ailerons. And we even have a little tiny trim tab over here on our tail. What a great innovation. So these airplanes were a little different. So um, you know, climbing inside of this, things are starting to get more sophisticated. Uh, one thing you'll notice is uh, somebody's gonna hit their elbow right on that or their knees, I should say. Oh, well, the fact there's a little step to climb over to get onto this particular point. <laughs> I just love how unsafe that is. You also notice, of course, so we have the presence of a galley. Uh, this is a non-pressurized airplane or anything along those lines. I like the little uh, kind of little light to let us know in the front here. A little washroom. Uh, we can, somebody left the door open. Hey, guys, come on. Come on. Somebody went to the bathroom. You'll notice we're starting to get the evolution of things like escape hatches, first aids, having flashlights, having fire extinguishers. And we're getting sort of the beginning of air safety, which was a big change for everybody who kind of came in up until this point. So go ahead and I'll close the cabin real quickly here. I'll go slam that one shut. Looks pretty good. You'll see a bunch of other things that change uh, now that we get into the uh, mid-30s. Uh, this is 1933, by the way, for the Boeing 247. You'll notice we still have the make loud noise handle. <laughs> And you also see, of course, a little bit of standardization to some of our controls. Uh, for some reason, our mixture control is all the way to zero. Uh, we'll have to take a look at what the deal with that is. Eh, go ahead and crank that. Ah, ah that's why. That makes sense. Uh, one of the interesting things is uh, because of the way these aircraft uh, spawn in the world, uh, sometimes some of that happens. No big deal. But more importantly, you'll notice we finally have an RPM control lever. Uh, the other thing you'll notice here is because our engines have gotten so much more powerful and more reliable, it's more work for us, the pilot, to control the engines. You'll notice that we have propeller levers. You'll notice we have throttle levers. We have mixture controls. Uh, you'll notice we have separate fuel pumps. You'll notice we have gear control. We have retracting landing gear. What a difference. Of course, in the early day, gear motors, you had to basically select the one that you wanted. If that didn't work, you know, you're provided with this giant handle, which you could basically click the switch, and you have to go ee -er, ee -er, ee -er, ee -er, ee -er, to basically crank the gear up or down. And of course, uh, our electrical systems. Uh, we're finally starting to get some electrical systems. But uh, what's changed so much, of course, is they're all fuse-based. And of course, if we blow a fuse, we got to climb in here, grab a spare fuse, and uh, shove it in there. Uh, we also noticed we have the presence of generators, uh, which is something we didn't have much of at this particular point. And now we have the ability to to actually go ahead and change the fuses in flight and produce our own electrical problem. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with generators, of course, so we have new issues with generators. And you know, of course, they're RPM dependent. You'll notice if I increase my RPM a little bit, my generator starts producing more power. As a matter of fact, we were actually running our engines, our whole airplane was actually pulling off the battery. We're only just now starting to produce uh, basically neutral power. We're actually to push this forward even further. You will see we're actually generating electricity now. <laughs> oh my gosh, that is so different. Notice, by the way, our radio is actually off. Uh, we didn't turn on our radio for this purpose. You also notice the presence of radios, uh, something we didn't really have a lot of in the 1920s. We did have some, but you started seeing the standardization of frequencies, uh, frequency ranges. Uh, you'll notice here our nice old handle gears, rails, things in kilocycles. Uh, again, we have all sorts of different components here. This is basically early NDB. I love the fact that the light is like absolutely murdering on our power generation, and we have all sorts of different components here. Love this stuff. Again, early ADB, NDBs. The other thing you're going to notice that we get in the 1930s, which is so different, is we're getting things like parking brakes. I can just whoosh, go ahead and hit the parking brake if I need to and actually hold the plane in place rather than rolling down the runway here. You'll notice we have a better fuel gauges. Uh, you'll notice we have the presence of being able to select different parts of the engine and determine its temperature. You'll notice we have early, early, early fuel gauges. Of course, these are old school fuel gauges, all this. You pull this out and you'll let it go. And it's a pressure-based unit, which tells us exactly how much fuel. You can actually click on this to tap that. If for some reason things get stuck, you actually have the ability to tap on the instrument to try to unstick it. Uh, we have an instrument that actually tells us what our intercarriage position is right 
right now, which is absolutely wild. Uh, again, stuff we didn't have a lot of at that particular point. You also notice we have a reliable measurement of things. We even have warning ranges for our airplanes, so we know exactly what our aircraft engines are doing and what they're capable of doing in a safe sort of sense. You also notice the presence of things like magneto switches. You notice the presence of having elevator trim cranks. You notice we have de-icing capabilities. So many things so different. So what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and uh, get this thing up in the air here power here uh, you can hear that thing rips this is a much quicker plane here and again the big twin engines gets us going we're still conventional landing gear at this particular point no which is no surprise but notice it doesn't take much to get this thing flying again our tail comes up first and we just give it just the world's gentlest tug and look at that but wait there's more watch this watch this i'm gonna put the landing gear up <gasps> oh my gosh that is an innovation you can watch all these really old school landing look at that look at that yeah, now we're talking modern airplanes here. I also knows my tail wheel is a retractor or anything like that. So fortunately for this airplane, we don't have to worry about cow flaps or anything like that. It's our next aircraft we're gonna have to deal with. Uh, notice we do have the presence of an attitude indicator here. Again, we have a directional gyro on board this aircraft. So many incredible innovations, but now I can even come over here and I can even reduce my RPM and my manifold pressure to a reasonable amount. So I'll pull my RPM back. Listen to that, the airplane gets a little bit quieter, but I still produce plenty of power for the purposes of my flight. And I've got all these controls right here, along with everything else in the world, uh, sitting there right there on the floor. My controls are a little bit heavier. Again, we've got a lot of metal, but now I could do things like set the trim. Uh, you can see the presence of my long range radio antenna. That's where the little cable is right there. You'll also notice a bunch of other things. So if we're looking over the wing. Our corrugation is mostly gone, but uh, you can tell by the millions of rivets here that we ha still have not solved the drag problem. And again, these are big old radial engines here, and we're going to see a lot of the radial engines with our next generation of airplanes. But one thing I noticed from a pilot's pilot's perspective is I want to go to push the uh, aileron to the right. I don't have to stand on the rudder pedal anymore. My rudder is quite a bit bigger and it's a much more stable aircraft. One thing we're still missing, of course, at this point are wing flaps. Uh, we're not going to get those yet. They were invented way back in the day, but it's not something that we're going to have access to. But of course, with all of this new stuff, me as a pilot, I've got a lot of work to do. I've actually got to pay attention to all my different instrumentation here. I've got to take an eye on my RPM. Is it going okay? Is my generator operating? I can see my two fuel pressure gauges are going all over the place there. I've got a fire extinguisher. What a lovely tool. I even have the ability to feather my propellers and I can even set my communication frequency. I have an actual radio on board. What an incredible set of innovations that this aircraft has compared to everything else. I love how the battery's master switch is just a click. Isn't that amazing? This shut the battery off just like that so if i'm on the ground and i just want to run it i can just like that I'm probably gonna blow 15 fuses doing that it's just incredible and uh, like again not that long it's only been about 30 years of aircraft innovation and we suddenly have airplanes like this and again uh, not pressurized or anything like that we still have uh, many of the creature comforts that we really really like that we don't have the electrical system is very 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 fragile again it's generator based so it's based on our rpm all these little components are there for us to make our lives a little more interesting. But again, we still have a ways to go before we start getting uh, what we kind of think of as modern planes. But the most incredible thing is if you fast forward just two years, watch what happens to our airplanes. I almost feel like this aircraft doesn't need an introduction because it was one of the most iconic and recognizable propeller driven aircraft in many, 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 many years. This is the Douglas Commercial 3, the DC-3. Uh, this particular one first flew in December of 1935, and uh, they still have these in the air today. I believe there's uh, 25 to 30 of them still registered and still flying. Uh, one of the classic jokes about the DC-3, of course, is uh, you know, so a bunch of spare parts basically flying in formation with each other. Uh, a lot of these were made, and when I say a lot, we're talking like 16,000. It's one of the most produced airplanes ever. Now, you're going to see a bunch of new things inside of this aircraft. And again, this is only two years after the 247. Uh, one thing you're going to notice is just the scale of the aircraft is so much, 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 much larger. You'll see the presence of oxygen systems here. Again, we're not pressurized here. Uh, one thing you'll notice, of course, is that we have a bunch of different communication systems on board. I have an actual intercom system, so I can talk to the guy over the racket that the engine makes, uh, which is kind of nice. You'll notice that our controls uh, still kind of have the distinctive wheel look to them, still pulling them. But again, we're still cable driven controls to give you an idea. But the most incredible thing, and again, keep in mind, some of this instrumentation was added after the fact. 
is the fact we now have more or less the gauges we think about. We have our standard airspeed indicator that's been marked. We have a standard altimeter, directional gyro. We have a standard attitude indicator. Again, a lot of these were retrofitted after the fact. We have ourselves a radio marker beacon for doing instrument flying. We have a radio altimeter, which is incredible. Believe it or not, they had one of these for quite an age. We have ourselves a good old-fashioned CDI, vertical speed. Swinging over to this side of things, you'll notice we have all sorts of great instruments for the purposes of determining engine performance. I have a set manifold pressure. I've got all my different RPM controls here, oil pressure, fuel pressure, and I even have even more. My co-pilot has his own set of instruments. Uh, the other thing you'll notice here is I can actually change what fuel tank I'm interested in looking at as far as capacity. It's all electrical now. Oh, uh, we have electrical warning lights that we can actually turn things on. We have systems that check to make sure landing gear is down. What's this? Is this an automatic pilot? Yes. We finally have automatic pilots. Uh, again, we actually had automatic pilots in the 20s, but this is one of the few autopilots that was actually not bad. Uh, you'll notice there's a million and one little knobs to basically adjust the sensitivity on this thing. I don't think that's a problem at all. I actually think that's kind of fun little innovation here. I'm um, looking at our engine quadrant, of course, our throttle quadrant. It's gotten busy. Uh, we have throttle controls. We have propeller controls. We have mixture controls. Mixture, by the way, is done automatic on most DC3s. You'll also notice if I go underneath this, uh, we have our tail wheel lock control underneath us. We have nose wheel trim. We have right wing up down. We have automatic power for turning things on and off, which is incredible. Uh, we have more things. Uh, we actually have variable carburetor heat to keep ice from forming inside of it. Uh, we can set those all manually. We can set our own kind of a th uh, fuel directions and all that. And incredibly, we have supercharger controls. This aircraft is capable of traveling at really significant altitudes. And one of the things we could actually do is change the gear of our supercharger, which provided some extra pressure at altitude to make this aircraft travel even higher. Uh, we'll see this in one of our later airplanes as well. But all this capability, all this capacity, all these wonderful innovations, and we have new problems to worry about, and that is going to be temperature. And of course, we see our cow flaps here, and we'll go ahead and open these suckers up to get ready for takeoff here. We'll snap these to the open position, and you'll notice on the edges of the wings here, these big flaps, actually, not the wings, the edges of the engine, will actually flip up, and I love how you have a little supercharger intake. It looks like something off like a V8 and a SEPTA. We have other things, too. Uh, we have the presence of hydraulic systems, uh, which is uh, something we haven't had before, uh, kind of like I said, when I got an upgrade. We have the ability to set an altitude limit for decision height, and we have so many electrical elements options. Uh, we can heat up our propeller. We can turn on lights. Uh, we can basically go ahead and uh, prime the engines with a switch. We have a magneto control. Keep in mind, this is a nicer version of the earlier DC-3s, but still, we have two separate electrical systems in case one fails. We can prop feather, or we have a radio system. We can eject out the top of this thing. Um, we have a whole avionics bay in here, so if one of our radios malfunctions, we can literally just remove it and put it back. Uh, we have some nice comfort as far as passengers goes. Again, we have nice little heat in here to keep it warm, and we're mostly metal, so things are not bad. We're getting really, really fancy. Uh, one thing you'll notice, though, is we're still a tail dragger. Uh, we do have flaps, of course, uh, something that we can see over there. Actually, press and hold the handle, and you can hear it hissing in my ear as the flaps basically position themselves to the correct position. Uh, we didn't need that much flaps for takeoff, but uh, usually for this plane, the flaps are used for the purposes of landing, not takeoff. But we at least have them. It's uh, definitely something we did not have before. Whoa. Go ahead and pay attention to what I'm doing here rather than uh, go ahead and uh, going all over the runway. One of the things I like is uh, once you get enough power, the thing just comes up. And uh, we also have another neat innovation here. We have flaps, and we also have retractable landing gear. Of course, the retractable landing gear and these things are a little bit old school there and we'll kind of get ourselves up. We have a radio system now. We can actually uh, communicate with the folks on the ground. We can kind of bring those flaps up. Again, you wouldn't use a lot of flaps for takeoff purposes. And our airspeeds are actually really impressive. Uh, we can achieve uh, basically 150 to 160 miles per hour. Uh, we can jump up on the radio real quickly here. We can request touch and goes, do all that other good stuff. Of course, uh, San Francisco, in case you were curious. And of course, as I climb up, um, I can just look down and just observe my power settings. I can go ahead and slide this backwards. Say I want to go to about 40 inches here. I'm going to go ahead and reduce my RPM just a little bit. Look at that. Nice. Just like that. I can go ahead and control it. If I want to shut my landing lights off, I can just hit a switch like that. I don't have to worry about my engines as something cutting out on me or anything like that. It's just incredible. And again, just a few years ago, we were fighting with fuses and all those other things. Not to say we're not going to be dealing with those. Um, the new thing we have to worry about, of course, is going to be our good friends. Um, <laughs> we're going to be dealing with uh, new problems now, and that's going to be circuit breakers, which is uh, kind of where we're going to be going with a lot of this technology. Before we had a lot of that stuff, uh, we kind of just had what we had. But again, incredible to see how all this technology had changed in such a short period of time. 
and of course uh, now with the bringing of all these radios we have to deal with all the excitement that kind of comes along with it kind of thing like that but they, that's part of the fun and let me go ahead and adjust that real fast so we don't have to uh, listen to that our entire flight here i just love that we can set a radio station and then we can put one on standby and then we can switch between the two just like that and it's just incredible incredible technology and we can de-ice ourselves we even had the capability to put on windshield wipers wow again all these things came out in a relatively short period of time making an aircraft like this while maybe not the fastest airplane of its era an incredible piece of technology for the purposes of uh, basically moving on and again in world war ii this was very famous for so many different purposes after world war ii uh, if you wanted to take a flight somewhere don't be surprised if it was a dc-3 just to give you an idea of just how long lasting this particular design has gone now our autopilots are still relatively primitive here our trim is still pretty darn effective Navigationally, uh, we're not inertial yet. Uh, we don't have any Loran. Uh, we're still going to be using uh, stellar navigation or celestial navigation for any purposes uh, that we need to do with that. Of course, uh, we're getting a different call here. Uh -huh, frequency change approved. Nice. I wasn't even on that frequency. So uh, one of the things you'll have, which is very fascinating too, is our navigation starting to get a little more sophisticated. Our controls are getting a little bit more balanced. Our safety is getting a little bit higher. Uh, we have that nice retractable landing gear. Notice they don't get sucked up all the way. I love the oil cooler just chilling there. Speaking of oil cooler, uh, we actually got to maintain flaps here. So we come over here, we snap these to the trailing flap position to reduce drag as well as, you know, keep the engines at proper temperature for most of our flight here. And again, it's amazing to see how this has changed. Now, what happens in just a few years, uh, starting in September of 1939, is going to bring about a whole new set of aircraft evolution. But we'll take a look at that on our next episode of the Evolution of Aircraft Design at Microsoft Flight Sim.